Our final speaker, Dr. Tama Rat, Wright, like Daniel and Miriam, she also enjoyed some measure of personal contact with Rabbi Zacks. Her academic research um, focuses on 20th century Jewish thought, including a recently published book entitled The Twilight of Jewish Philosophy, Immanuel Levinas's Hermeneutics, and several articles focusing on the thought of Martin Buber, Fackenheim, and other representatives of post-Holocaust theology. However, in addition to serving as research fellow at the London School of Jewish Studies and adjunct professor at Bernard Revel, Tamra has also been involved in multi-faith educational initiatives and leadership de development training. Tamra's current research project, inspired by Rabbi Zacks, involves developing a new musal, combining positive psychology with Jewish sources. Thank you so much, Professor Ross. And I want to look at the people in the back and just check. Raise your hand if you can hear. No, that doesn't work. Um, Elliot, can you hear okay? No. Okay. Higher. Yeah? So while we're waiting, let's all wish Elliot a very happy birthday. <laughs> he heard that. <laughs> and everyone, I really appreciate your patience. It's not the favorite slot for most speakers right before lunch and right after such a rich morning of discussion, debate, conversation, and scholarly um, input into the very first publication, academic publication of Rabbi Sachs, which we have now confirmed was the essay Alienation and Faith. Is that correct? I'm asking you, Larry. Alienation and Faith. Alienation and Faith was spring, summer, 73. And Rose and Swag was winter. So we were close. We were close. Okay, so. Scholarly details. Uh, scholarly details are very important. The other important thing I want to, other important thing I want to tell you has been going on behind the scenes, is there's been a conversation about who amongst the uh, students of Rabbi Sachs started to learn from him first. So I'm going to put in a bid for the autumn of 1987. And if you can top that, come and speak to me after lunch. And I look forward to hearing from you. Um, the other thing that I want to do is just before we get into a little bit more philosophy and a little bit more storytelling, is to think about what would have been very important for Rabbi Sachs to do if he had been here. And at this point, I look to Elaine and I look to Joanna. And I tell you that one of the things that I learned from watching him over so many decades is that he would have noticed the people behind the scenes. Am I right, Joanna? Yes. And he would have thanked them. And so I hope we have the names right. You've all heard the thank yous to the organizing committee, to the academics who've done such an amazing job, and to the leadership team of bar -Ilan that have welcomed us and created this amazing conference. But Miriam, I believe that there are other people behind the scenes who we in the hotel, the, the lecturers staying in the hotel, have particularly appreciated knowing that magical taxis arrive when they're needed, take us to these foreign places that we need to get to, and then come and collect us at the end of the day. It's incredible. So I believe the people responsible are Yafit and Aura. Is that correct? Sipi. Sipi. Sipi, Aura, and... Leora, Shelley, Shani, Nati. Okay. All right. Uh, so, big round of applause for them. Thank you so much. Okay. So, my title, my first title, is There is a Moral Obligation to Be Clear. Thank you, Miriam, for. Uh, defining, identifying the source of that quotation. But if any of you, apart from the people in the taxi with me last night, know the source of that quotation, again, please talk to me at lunchtime. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that at the end of my talk. Um, and then my subtitle is Continental and Analytical Philosophy in the Thought of Rabbi Sachs. Now, if there's anybody on the live stream or in the room for whom these words, these terms, continental and analytic, don't really mean anything to you, what I'm going to say is don't worry about it. Um, for academic purposes, I recently had to go and Google and find out some nice definition of these terms. And the definition was written by an academic who basically says, 
these terms don't make any sense. Okay. However, they roughly make sense to people in the know as being a division between, oh, I'm going to look at Eliot again. Right, Eliot, many years ago you said to me, this Levinas, does he have good things to say or is he just a woolly continental thinker? <laughs> right? That is the way that what are called Anglo-American or analytical philosophers like to characterize the people that I hang out with. Okay. <laughs> So that's all we need by way of definition. Um, I'm going to draw on some biographical material, uh, but really my primary interest is philosophical. And in a sense, um, I'm sort of siding with Daniel, which is that I spent my time as, you know, as a graduate student, as an academic, most of my time kind of thinking about philosophy and um, have sort of come to the conclusion that there are actually in some cases, better and more useful things to think about. So I'm not sure that the term philosopher is necessarily the highest accolade, but again, if you're annoyed by that, talk to me at lunchtime. We don't have time right now. I want to start with a story, and I want to share with you that it can be quite tense being a presenter at a conference like this, because as you listen to all of these brilliant people, um, share their favorite teachings of Rabbi Sachs, the favorite books, or the favorite um, uh, writing, saying, etc. you wait with bated breath and you think, oh, great, but they didn't say that part that I want to say. <laughs> now, the part that I want to say from the famous TED Talk is a story that Rabbi Sachs told. And it's a story that in some small way I personally identify with because in some ways my philosophical journey has kind of paralleled his, but in, in very small ways. But let's start with the story because it's a beautiful story. And um, I'm going to say the words, but you have to imagine it in the voice of Rabbi Sachs, which I know you can all do. So he started this TED Talk by saying, once upon a time, a very long time ago, I was a 20-year-old undergraduate studying philosophy. I was into Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and Sartre and Camus. I was full of ontological uncertainty and existential angst. It was terrific. <laughs> I was, he continued, self-obsessed and thoroughly unpleasant to know. Okay, at this point, I'm going to interrupt myself and give you homework. Michael Harris says that you never leave a meeting with Tamara without homework. You're going to enjoy this homework. So whether you have watched the TED Talk in the past or not, I'm going to give you the assignment to watch it again. And I'm going to give you the really key background information, which I think only two other people in this room know. I'm not sure. And that is this. Rabbi Sachs gave this talk at the it was 2017 uh, TED conference in Vancouver. Elaine, you were there. Joanna, you were there. Was anybody else there? Great. Okay, this is the inside information that I want to share with you. Rabbi Sachs was originally scheduled to give the first talk. And Joanna had told me that. And my husband and I went to this very special cinema screening of the whole of that session of the conference. And um, we were in shock when somebody else gave the first TED Talk. And somebody else who wasn't Rabbi Sachs gave the second one and the third and so on and so forth. And the interesting thing was, you know, you know TED Talks. They're usually pretty good. They're very well produced. And there are sometimes literal pyrotechnics. So everybody else was doing all kinds of sound and light shows. And then Elaine, you remember, Rabbi Sachs walks out in the gold tie. Just him, just the man and the ideas and the power of his voice. And he had them in the palm of his hand within seconds. And it was incredibly, incredibly moving. OK, so that's your homework. You have to watch that talk again. Moving on. So we left Rabbi Sachs as, a, as an undergraduate at Cambridge, full of existential angst. And then what happened? He says, um, one day, I saw across the courtyard a girl who was everything that I wasn't. She radiated sunshine. She emanated joy. I found out her name was Elaine. We met, we talked, we married, and 47 years, three children, and eight grandchildren later, this now needs to be updated, a belated muscle stuff, um, I can safely say it was the best decision I ever took in my life because it's the people not like us that make us grow. Okay, and so what you have encapsulated here by Rabbi Sachs is this movement away from a kind of intellectually sophisticated but deeply depressing philosophy towards, I would almost put it in biblical terms, choosing life, 
choosing joy. Okay, and so it's not obvious from the way he tells the story whether it was the continental philosophers who made him depressed or the depression that attracted him to the continental philosophers. We leave that to history and we carry on. Okay, so I love this kind of Levinasian theme of encountering the other, someone who is radically unlike the self. But what most interests me here is the trajectory of his philosophical thought insofar as we can trace it through his published writings. And at this point, I want to make a confession, which is that I started a kind of systematic project of looking through the indexes of all the books and finding all the references to Buber and Levinas and so on and so forth. Um, but then I got sort of pulled into an idea, and it's really the idea that I want to emphasize. But there we are. So um, I want to go back to the kind of intellectual biography that he portrays in this TED Talk. And I want to refer, as so many people have done today, to his first published book that, that Larry is holding. And I want to say to you that um, Rabbi Sachs was a voracious reader. We all know that. And he read some surprising things as well. You know, for example, uh, one of his uh, children had the four-hour work week by Tim Ferriss on his bookshelf. And I said, that's interesting. How'd you come across that? He said, oh, Rabbi Sachs recommended it. Right? So he read voraciously. He read everything. And so, of course, he read the continental philosophers. And some of their ideas come out in his books, sometimes to critique them, sometimes to engage with them, whatever. But in general, it would say that the, um, the continental philosophers that he talked about in the TED Talk don't really appear all that much in his published writings. Um, the, the references to the French existentialists, I would say, are not much more detailed than we might reasonably expect from a well-read thinker who came of age in the 1960s. I know for younger people here, you can barely imagine what that would be, but that's okay. Right? And also, from my knowledge of the Cambridge philosophy curriculum, they would not have figured heavily on that <laughs> reading list. Right? So those in the know are laughing in the corner. That's great. Okay. Um, but, uh, and then the German philosophers as well. Often in his later writings, when he talks about those German philosophers, it's in the context, as Miriam said, as talking about um, their anti-Semitism, right? And the problem of, of anti-Semitism within German philosophy. Um, however, Nietzsche actually emerges as a key reference point or even a foil in his book, The Great Partnership and Elsewhere. And he acknowledges the importance of Nietzsche's description of the age of the death of God, for understanding what is at stake in our contemporary Western, world, Western world's turn away from religion. I'll return to this. So in his first book, though, he does pay attention to three European Jewish philosophers, uh, Buber, Rosenzweig, and, of course, Soloveitchik. And his discussion of Buber concludes with the following assessment. Um, he says that Buber actually belongs not in the tradition of Jewish thought, but that in that of post-Kantian and existentialist philosophy. And of course, Rabbi Sachs, as an orthodox thinker, takes issue with Buber because Buber uh, rejects the idea of heteronymous halacha. Okay? Um, and uh, what Buber talks about is the, re the reality of revelation, but for Buber... Revelation is without content. There's a revelation of divine presence, of the presence of what he calls the eternal thou, but there's no content to it. He says, the quote is, man receives and he receives not a specific content, but a presence. And after carefully outlining some of the key ways in which Buber's understanding of chassidut and of biblical theology differ from more traditional approaches, Rabbi Sachs concludes with a paradoxical, paradoxical statement, and here I'm interested in what Jonathan Reinhold was saying about uh, the need for a public intellectual to say clear and memorable things. So this book is, as you said, it's much more dense than many of the later books, but he has this memorable turn of phrase where he says that the most we could claim for Buber was, would be that he was the theologian of Jewish secularism. Okay, so we will find allusions to Buber. We will find the language of I, thou in his later writing. Um, but there are also many places where I find him talking about the relationship between self and other, and I expect him to reference 
Buber or Levinas or Rosenzweig, and he goes elsewhere, which I also find very interesting. But continuing on, there's a chapter on Rosenzweig, which Miriam quoted from, but again, I was relieved that it was a slightly different quote. Um, and I want to go sort of straight to the critique of Rosenzweig, because he does say that Rosenzweig is indispensable and important in so many ways. But what interests me is his critique, where he says, that Rosenzweig, Rosenzweig's work is ultimately only a preface to future authentic Jewish thought because Rosenzweig, in, in Rabbi Sachs's terms, was a great translator of Torah, but not a genuine Baal Teshuvah because Rosenzweig's perceptions of Judaism, and this is a quote, were still mediated by the forms of the previous non-Jewish vision. His vision was not yet a vision from within Judaism. And I'll just give you one example. So Rabbi Sachs says that Rosenzweig failed to recognize and internalize the true significance of Yom Kippur. Um, because Rosenzweig saw in the rituals of the Day of Atonement the solitary individual confronted by the fact of death. But according to Rabbi Sachs, <coughs> excuse me, at Yom Kippur is actually traditionally the day par excellence when the community stands together in absolute collectivity. And as we will see, I think that this critique is similar to the concerns that he raises, and we heard such an interesting talk about this morning, the concerns he raises about Soloveitchik's lonely man of faith. Um, as I said before, uh, Rabbi Sachs does occasionally mention Rosenzweig in his later writings, and he often alludes to this tripart tripartite structure of creation, revelation, and redemption that we can learn from Rosenzweig, but that Rabbi Sachs is very careful often to trace back to earlier Jewish thinkers. So perhaps unsurprisingly, Rabbi Sachs was more sympathetic to Soloveitchik and made, uh, makes much more frequent reference to Soloveitchik throughout his corpus. And as I think uh, Larry mentioned earlier, there are three essays on Soloveitchik in that first book, uh, Tradition in an Untraditional Age. And for my purposes, the most interesting one is the one that you focused on, alienation and faith. And you did the math for us, or the arithmetic, this morning to point out what a young rabbi, Rabbi Sachs, was then uh, a teacher on the faculty at Jews College. Um, and he critiques, as we heard, he critiques Soloveitchik. And I'm making a parallel between the way that he criticized Rosenzweig for understanding Yom Kippur in individualistic terms. He critiques Soloveitchik's typology of Adam 1 and Adam 2 on the basis that it doesn't allow for a stance that transcends loneliness. So this theme of loneliness is clearly disturbing him. Um, and in, the, in this original article, he humbly presents his own approach as an alternative phenomenology of the Jewish self, uh, one which he says is presented in contrast rather than disagreement. However, when he refers to the essay in Future Tense in 2009, he's a bit less circumspect, and he simply describes it as a critique of the lonely man of faith, thus supporting your argument from this morning. And I would argue that alienation and faith lays the groundwork for much of his later writing. In his, in his engagement with Soloveitchik, he sets out an opposition between two ways in which Jewish thought can be relevant to contemporary concerns. He labels these the empathetic and the redemptive. And I'm just going to summarize and basically say, if the approach is empathetic, we understand what's going on, let's say, in the contemporary culture, but we get overly engrossed in it. And Rabbi Sachs says, you know, there's a, a downside and a plus side to any approach. The empathetic approach takes away the possibility of offering redemption to the people who are suffering from whatever that current uh, malaise would be. Um, the approach that he wants to take is what he calls redemptive. It offers a way of escape, the possibility of new and unforeseen perspectives. And although he acknowledged that Soloveitchik's approach to alienation wasn't identical with that of contemporary Western culture, he nevertheless felt it was closer to the empathetic than to the re redemptive approach. And he highlighted that Soloveitchik's essay marked, I quote here, a point in time where a defining mood of Judaism finds an echo in the prevalent mood of the secular world, a time when the two might share a vocabulary of the emotions. Uh, 
And instead of that, uh, Rabbi Sachs argued for this redemptive approach. He argued for an understanding of Judaism that holds out the promise of a more harmonious way of being. There is, he wrote, a sense strongly present in the account of Adam's creation, persisting through the Torah, explicit in Psalms, and analyzed often enough in Kabbalistic sources, that alienation and loneliness are defective states, the consequence of sin, and that the religious man, I would say, or woman, of any age transcends divisions, subsumes contrast into harmonious emotion, and exists in unmediated closeness to God, the world, and other Jews. Uh, Tamar, I know that time doesn't permit a full exposition of the details of this argument. Nobody's after you. You can go on forever. Oh, but they might be hungry. <laughs> um, but Rabbi Sachs' summary at the end of the article is significant. And again, I quote, he says, in summary, not one but two readings of the inner possibilities of the Jew are, are implicit in tradition. And with them go two interpretations of man's creation, of his stance toward the world and God, and of the nature of his relation to other men. And at a time when loneliness is the condition of the estranged Jew, one reading offers empathy, the other healing. And of course, obviously, Rabbi Sachs is going to opt for the stance that offers healing. So this is the point where I got kind of pulled in and very interested in the content rather than just sort of what's he doing with, with the continental philosophers. And I think that we see here, as, as also Miriam pointed out in a slightly different way, we see here in this very early essay, Rabbi Sachs setting out what his mission is going to be. Um, and I want, I want to say that in the most general way, his mission was to offer a gateway into redemptive healing for Jews and for non-Jews alike. And that methodologically, what interests me is that his approach to both Jewish and secular thought was to evaluate interpretations and ideas, not just on their intellectual merits, which are important, but on his assessment of their real world consequences and implications. And it seems to me that it was on this basis that he rejected both the continental approach to philosophy with its existential angst, dialectical tensions, and ontological uncertainty, and the analytical streams of philosophy that were prevalent during his university studies. And this is where I get it back. I, I come back to Eliot and say, well, you call us woolly, but listen to this. OK, so um, continental philosophy, we've already talked about why he rejected it at the time. Um, but he, he also rejected the language-focused analytical approach that held sway in Oxford and Cambridge during his years of postgraduate study. Um, and he did so not because the philosophy would have direct negative consequences, but really because it would have no consequences whatsoever. It was completely lacking in relevance. And I'm going to quote from uh, The Great Partnership. He says, it seems like analytical, philosoph analytical philosophy had given up on the big questions. It seemed less like the search for wisdom than a kind of high-minded lexicography, as if the great arguments that had divided serious minds for 25 centuries could be resolved or dissolved by mere reflection on what words mean. OK, more things to argue about over lunch. I'm looking forward to that. So as we have seen, um, he rejected the European Jewish thinkers, so our Rosenzweig and Buber, um, on the basis that their approaches were not fully aligned with key elements of traditional Judaism. And as we've seen, I think, several times today, even Soloveitchik's work was crit critiqued due to sharing a despairing mood with contemporary Western culture. And so I just wanted to return to the biographical for a moment. If the analytic, analytic approaches were unsatisfying, existentialism and other continental approaches were too depressing, and the Jewish dialogical philosophers were just not quite Jewish enough, what was a young Jewish philosopher to do? As he recounts in The Great Partnership, the questions he began grappling with during his student days went well beyond his concern to reconcile his personal commitment to Jewish faith with the scientific and philosophical understandings of the day. During those years, under the guidance of Bernard Williams, he began to appreciate the catastrophic societal consequences of the West's loss of religion. Nietzsche, he writes, quote, was by far the most prophetic moralist or anti-moralist of modern times. 
No one saw more clearly the consequences of abandoning Christian ethics. Once the Christian conscience was eliminated, human beings would be forced to become brutal, ruthless, hard, impose their will on others, and give full rein to the violence that Christian compassion had emasculated for so long. Uh, now I look in that corner. As Daniel Reinhold and Michael Harris have so thoroughly pointed out, contemporary Nietzsche scholars have offered more nuanced readings of his views on morality. However, I am much less interested in assessing the validity of Rabbi Sachs' summaries of other philosophers' positions than in understanding how he responded to them. And I just want to share, I was talking with Sam in the corridor earlier, um, Harold Bloom has this idea about poets, that every poet has to sort of start afresh, and um, that what they do is strong misreadings of their predecessors. Right? And by sort of creating an image of their predecessors as wrong in some way, bad, not good enough in some way, it creates space for them to find their own voice. And maybe some of the time when Rabbi Sachs is just a little bit slapdash in his portrayal of the arguments of some of our favorite thinkers, um, he's doing that. He's creating a foil. And what's really important um, is what he has to say of positive consequence as opposed to the kind of nitty gritty nuanced details of a scholarly exposition of some other philosopher. Okay, there we are. That was Tamara digressing from Tamara's text. I'm gonna come back to it. Okay, so, um, so I think that in this instance, coming back to Nietzsche, uh, what he took from Nietzsche and from others was a warning about what will happen if religion collapses in the West and he, saw, he sought to present an alternative. Um, his discussion of Nietzsche, and I'm particularly interested in his use of Camus, is emblematic of how he chose to operate philosophically. Commenting on Camus' notion of the absurd, he points out its similarity to Greek tragedy, insofar as it is an outlook that believes in fate rather than freedom, and that in the deepest sense is bereft of hope. Most importantly, he says, this view, and here I quote, is coherent, lucid, perfectly rational within its own terms of reference. End of quote. There is, in other words, no purely rational reason for dismissing this worldview. But on the other hand, there's no purely rational reason for embracing it either. And here's the rhetorical question. Why embrace absurdity, he asks, when one could choose instead to live a hope-filled, meaningful existence based on religious faith? And what interests me is that it seems to me that this is structurally parallel to the strategy he used in the essay on the lonely man of faith. What he likes to do is to show that there are alternative interpretations and to choose the one that is more conducive to a happy, meaningful life and one that is in keeping with traditional Judaism or with Rabbi Sachs' understanding of Judaism. And this approach also overlaps with a persistent theme in his writings on psychology, which, as Tamar pointed out, is something that interests me a lot. So when he talks about psychology, particularly positive psychology, he talks about this idea of reframing, something that he learned from CBT and positive psychology. Um, and common to his writings on philosophy and on psychology is the observation that situations and events do not come with singular fixed meanings attached to them. Rather, we are free to choose from alternative meanings and interpretations and to generate our own. So I'm definitely aware that my time is pretty much up. And I haven't yet addressed the quotation in my title. And I don't think anybody is going to come up to me and tell me where it's from, but I'm still hoping they will. But the, uh, my source for this quotation it's actually a private conversation with Dr. Viva Zornberg, at which I was present um, in the chief rabbi's residence in Hamilton Terrace in 2013. And in the course of that really fascinating conversation, you would have loved to have been a fly on the wall at that conversation, sorry you couldn't, uh, Rabbi Sachs said, I believe that there is a moral obligation to be clear. 
And Dr. Zornberg, as you may imagine, had a different take. Uh, but we, we didn't have the chance to pursue the conversation. The remarks stayed with me all these years, and I really do regret that I never questioned Rabbi Sachs on his precise meaning. However, within the context, I understood the emphasis on clarity to be part of the reason for his relative lack of interest in continental philosophy, especially postmodernism, and indeed for his occasional expressions of impatience with it. But returning to his first published essay, which we have now definitively, definitively established was Alienation and Faith, I will conclude with a suggestion that we read that essay as an early articulation of the mission that would guide his life's work. In full cognizance of the intellectual and societal forces driving the West to secularism, he sought to articulate as clearly as possible a vision of Judaism that offered the promise of, and again quoting his words, transcending divisions, subsuming contrast into harmonious emotion, and enabling individuals to exist in unmediated closeness to God, the world, and other Jews. In other words, the angst-filled Cambridge undergraduate that we met in the TED Talk um, would in time teach the world a Jewish philosophy of happiness, and on that note, I encourage you to enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you.